Good morning once again. Yes, thank you. Good to see you all. We're going to be continuing our sermon series in sort of the early chapters of the Gospel of Luke. And we're calling this sermon series uh, Hidden in Plain Sight. We're looking at how Jesus came as the Son of God. He came as Israel's Messiah. And yet how common it was for people to miss that. Now, some of this just had to be because, you know, Jesus was born in a stable and, and shepherds were the only ones that were told about it. Uh, there are some other stories, though, uh, where people maybe should have seen things and recognized things and they didn't. And we've looked at some of the unique material that we get in Luke's gospel, right? The, the story of Mary and Joseph, for instance, dedicating the infant Jesus in the temple, and elderly uh, Simeon and Anna coming and, and recognizing, being the only ones that recognized the Holy Family for who they were. Um, we, we saw the maybe somewhat humorous story of Mary and Joseph losing track of 12-year-old Jesus at the Feast of Passover and then finding him in the temple courts talking with the teachers of the law. And then last week, we, we looked at a passage that actually all of the gospel writers record in one way or another, uh, Jesus' baptism in the River Jordan. And today, we're going to look at another relatively familiar one, Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. As I said, it's easy to see in some of those earliest stories, when Jesus was just a, a baby or a small child, uh, that he really was the Son of God hiding in plain sight because only a few special people, generally not the ones that you'd expect, actually recognized or had it revealed to them, I should say, who he was. And last week, if we just want to recap here a little bit, we looked at the first stories of Jesus as a man at about 30 years old, beginning his public ministry, appearing on the scene. And uh, as Luke tells that story, it was quite a behind-the-scenes affair as well. Jesus just appeared on the banks of the Jordan as, as one more person in the crowd. Jesus, uh, Luke says, just other people were getting baptized. Jesus came. He also got baptized. There was, no, there was no royal entourage. There were no bands playing. No one cheered. No one unfurled banners, anything of that sort. As, as the other gospel writers do, Luke records that the Holy Spirit descended from heaven in the appearance of a dove. And he reports that a voice spoke from heaven, though from Luke's account, it's not even actually 100% clear whether the crowd that was standing there heard the voice or understood it, or certainly whether all of the people understood what God the Father spoke. And then what happens? Well, that's what we're going to read about today. As Luke tells the story, the people were in great expectation for what Messiah, that he was going to come. And then when he came, what was he going to do? I'd invite you to stand, and we will hear about Jesus' next, next moves. Luke chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they were over, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours." And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. This is the word of the Lord. You can be seated. 
So with the expectation that Messiah is either here or about to be here, about to proclaim himself, amazing things are on the verge of happening, what does Jesus do? Not really what we would probably do. Certainly not what we would think of as spectacular. He disappears for a number of weeks to go out into the desert alone where no one can find him and face the temptation of the devil. Probably not if he'd like got a focus group or some consultants and asked them like what would be the best way to start out being Messiah. I don't think that's what they would have suggested. They would have probably said something like, the people are in eager anticipation, Jesus. Now's the time. Capitalize on that. Make some hay while the sun shines. Launch from a place of strength. Withdrawing for fasting and prayer? No, that's, that's not the, the usual pattern for success. Jesus' public ministry begins with him being awfully hidden. And why? Like, what does this time in the desert accomplish? What does that mean for us? So let's take a look at this story. First of all, whereas the Gospel of Mark just says Jesus went out to the wilderness to be tested by the devil and just kind of summarizes it in a sentence or two, Matthew and Luke each record three specific temptations that Jesus faced. Particular, uh, particularly attentive readers will notice that Matthew and Mark present them in slightly different orders, and we'll discuss that briefly later on. But let's look at each of these three temptations in turn, as Luke tells them. First of all, the devil tempts Jesus to satisfy his cravings. Clearly, after fasting for such a long period of time, he was literally starving. He's weak. He is vulnerable. And so often, as is the case, that's when the devil chooses to make his attack. And this is kind of the attack at the most basic level. Jesus is hungry, and the devil tempts him to turn stones into bread and satisfy that craving. Now, there's nothing wrong with desiring food when you're hungry. This is how God made us. There are obviously, wrong and sinful desires as well, either desiring things that are just forbidden or desiring good things, but in a way or in an amount that is sinful. So what's the problem exactly with this temptation? Again, desiring food when you're hungry clearly falls into the first category, a a desire for a thing that's not wrong. We need to take a step back and see that the devil frames this temptation in terms of if you are the son of God. Now, of course, the last, there's a genealogy in there at the end of Luke chapter 3. But the last part where we hear the story of Jesus' life is he's baptized and the father speaks from heaven and says, You are my beloved son, in you I'm well pleased. And then Jesus goes out into the wilderness and the first thing the devil says to him is, if you are really the son of God, what the devil's doing is setting up or attempting to set up anyhow a sort of catch-22 situation for Jesus. Prove you're the son of God by doing something that will disprove that you're the son of God, right? Prove you're the son of God by doing something that shows you're not really fully, fully trusting in your father, to take care of you. Prove you're the son of God by doing something that goes against the character of being the son of God. You see what I mean? Being the son of God was about identity for Jesus. This is who he was. This is who his father affirmed him to be. And this is what he was to live his mission out of. That he was the son of God and could rely fully and completely on his father and could fully and completely and perfectly do his father's will. It, it was foundational. It was something to be lived out of as a given, not something to be proved whenever someone questioned it. And so that's what Jesus recognizes when he quotes the scripture as he resists this first temptation. Man shall not live by bread alone. Now, Luke omits the longer context, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. But it's certainly relevant to this story. The word that just came from the mouth of God himself was that Jesus was the Son of God. So the devil offers him another temptation at this point. He shows him the kingdoms of the world. 
And he says, I'll give you the authority and glory of these kingdoms of the world. All you have to do is worship me. Now let's just unpack this for a moment. If you or I was offered the, the kingdoms of the world, that would be a wrong thing to even want. We all know the axiom, right? Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely, right. So it would, power is bad enough. Being offered absolute power over all the kingdoms of the world, that would be a terrible thing and we would make a terrible mess of it because we are sinners, right? We know this. The sort of people who want to boss others around should never be the sort of people that get near any place where they have the ability to boss other people around. But it's not actually wrong for Jesus to want the authority over the kingdoms of the world. The devil doesn't explicitly quote this, but I wonder if it's in the background. Psalm 2, verse 7. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Being the son... You can draw a straight line from that to rightful authority over all the nations of the world. But the devil is proposing to him a line from the one to the other that looks a lot different than what the Father's will for Jesus is. Right? He's proposing him a different way to get there. A shortcut. Right. Even though that Satan didn't actually, in this telling, start the temptation with, if you are the Son of God, it's pretty clear that that's what he's implying. The nations of the world, along with their glory, are Jesus' rightful inheritance, but not yet, not at this point, and certainly not in this way. Satan is making a sort of, last time there was a kind of a catch-22. Now it's a sort of ends justifies the means temptation you know this is a good thing you're going to get there eventually why take that road of, of suffering and this long obedience to the father I'll present you with a shortcut and Jesus again recognizes it for what it is and he stands firmly in the truth worship the Lord your God and serve only him The devil offers him one more temptation. Jump from the pinnacle of the temple. At that point, the devil even kind of gets in on the quoting scripture game. He gets explicit with his quoting of the scripture. And, and uses that and twists that into another temptation for Jesus. He quotes the scripture that says, The angels will bear you up, Jesus. You won't be harmed. It says you won't even strike your foot against a stone. And I think the, the implication there is like, well, surely you believe the scriptures, Jesus. You're not doing this. You're not going to say no to this out of fear that God really won't come through for you, are you? The devil initially offered Jesus a way to be the Messiah and get what that entailed, the inheritance of all the nations of the world, by worshiping him rather than worshiping the Father. Right? So he's offering him, here's the thing that's rightfully yours. Take a wrong way to get to that. Take a shortcut. We'll, we'll change how this is going to play out to get there. This temptation seems more about, okay, you have this idea what it means to be the Messiah and stuff. Let's maybe change that a little bit. Right? You seem to be off on this like, you know, I'm going to be a humble Messiah. I'm not going to be a Messiah who does these big spectacles if that's not what my father wants. And, and it seems like the devil is saying, okay, okay, like you don't have to disobey your father then to be the Messiah, but let's take this in a different direction. Why don't you jump? And when the angels catch you, it's going to be a tremendous spectacle and everybody's going to see this and they're going to flock to you and this is how you're going to be the Messiah. Not, not a suffering Messiah. Forget about that, Jesus. Let's have you be a spectacle Messiah 
and said. And Jesus once again answers with a quotation from Scripture. Don't put the Lord your God to the test. In other words, I think Jesus is saying, you know what? The the promise from Scripture is true. I'm not denying that and I'm not doubting that. But it's about God protecting you when you find yourself overwhelmed by bad circumstances. Not about deliberately placing yourself in harm's way to try to force God's hand. And then it says, after these three temptations, that the devil left him, at least for a time. At least until another opportune time. Which, if you continue reading in Luke's gospel, you'll find at least a couple of those. Now, having looked at these three temptations, I want to do something further before we ask questions about how we apply this to our lives. Let's ask a couple of further questions from the text. I mentioned at the start that both Matthew and Luke present this story of Jesus' temptations in the wilderness. And as I got reading it, I think I knew this already, I'm pretty sure I had observed this at some point, but really not thought much of it. Why do they present the last two in the different order? The accounts read very similarly. Both begin with the temptation to turn stones into bread. But Matthew places the kingdoms of the world and their glory last, whereas Luke places the pinnacle of the temple last. Why? On the one hand, Matthew's version makes a lot of sense because it kind of goes from like a personal temptation to a mission temptation to a a cosmic or world-sized temptation. On the other, Luke's version makes sense because it seems like the devil's craftiness increases as the temptation goes on, with the final one being where the devil is even trying to twist scripture around in order to confuse Jesus. So they both kind of have a different way that uh, the temptations are escalating in intensity. I think, and this seems to be the best that scholars can come up with as well, is that it has to do with the two authors' respective purposes in in writing their Gospels. Matthew is sort of an inside-out story, right? Matthew is primarily writing for a Jewish audience, but he's also trying to get them to see that the Gospel is to come to them and then go out. And so famously, Matthew's Gospel ends in, in Matthew chapter 28 with the Great Commission, the call to go and make disciples of all nations. So it's a sort of addressed to the Jewish people first, and then going out from there. Luke is kind of doing the opposite thing. He's writing and addressing primarily a Gentile audience and trying to get them to see that salvation is coming from the nation of Israel. It's an outside-in perspective. And the ordering of these temptations seems to reflect that. Remember when I talked earlier about Jesus being presented in the temple as a baby in Luke chapter 2. An elderly Simeon prophesies to Mary that Jesus is going to grow up to be controversial. And ominously, he makes this, this prediction that a sword will pierce Mary's heart also. Right, so there Jesus is in the temple, and there's this prophecy made about his life and his mission and what that's going to look like. And we noted that Jesus doesn't show up in Jerusalem or the temple, in Luke's telling of the story anyhow, again, until Palm Sunday, where he sets in motion the events that lead to his execution. Unless, that is, you count this temptation. And it's a bit hard to know whether uh, the devil tempting Jesus to throw himself off the pinnacle of the temple is Jesus was physically present standing on the pinnacle of the temple, whether the devil presented this to him in a vision. It's not exactly clear. But I do think, in any case, it's relevant to our story. And this is why I think Luke emphasized that temptation last. He's setting up that Jesus' mission is going to end in Jerusalem and be closely connected to what's going on at the temple. But what is it going to be? 
right? When Jesus gets to Jerusalem, what is his mission going to turn into? Is it going to be Jesus in Jerusalem as a, as a spectacle, as a Messiah who comes in power and authority to, to glorify himself, to be a big deal? The kind of powerful Messiah that people are expecting at this point? Or will it be the road that Jesus seems to have set himself on from the very start, and as was prophesied, he's going to show up in Jerusalem to be a suffering Messiah. And this seems to be what Luke is emphasizing by ending with that temptation in particular. The road leads to Jerusalem, but what's it going to look like when you get there? Second question if you are paying attention to the readings or if your Bible has some cross-references or footnotes or whatnot, you might have noticed that Jesus' answers to the devil's temptations come from the book of Deuteronomy. So why does Jesus quote these as he does? I mean, on the one hand, they do kind of seem to be fitting answers to the devil's temptations, so there's that. But given that these temptations all seem to be about Jesus' identity as the Son of God or as the Messiah, we, we might have expected, you know, maybe he should hop around a little bit here. Like, there are more explicit passages in the Old Testament that he could go to, like Psalm 2, that specifically address what it means to be the Son of God, right? Or he could go to passages in the prophet Isaiah, that, that really outline what his ministry is going to be, be like. The, the suffering servant, for example. So let's talk a little bit about Deuteronomy. It's the last book of the law of Moses, given to Israel after they've spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness. That might be relevant as punishment for their lack of faith when they were first offered the chance to enter the promised land. Right? So we have Exodus tells the story of them leaving and the giving of the law. Leviticus and, and then Numbers tells of their story, uh, their failure to enter the promised land. They wander for a long time. And when that generation dies off 40 years later, Moses, as sort of his last will and testament, delivers the book of Deuteronomy as his final address to the people as the Lord is giving them a second chance to enter the promised land. It famously begins with, with these words. It is 11 days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea in the 40th year on the first day of the 11th month. A journey that should have taken them a couple of weeks has taken them 40 years. And the big burning question all throughout the book of Deuteronomy seems to be, are you going to make good on this second chance that you've been given? Are you going to be faithful in obeying the Lord and doing things his way rather than your own way? At the end of this trying time in the wilderness, what choice are you going to make? Who are you going to serve, Israel? This is from Deuteronomy chapter 30. Sort of as Moses is wrapping up the book, he's given them a, a renewed version of the laws that the Lord has pronounced for them. He's encouraged them and exhorted them to keep this. He's told them about the feasts. He's presented the blessings and curses. And finally, he begins to wrap it up by saying these words. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today, by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways, and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away, and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess." 
I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. Loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, and holding fast to him, for he is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give to them. Of course, what's the problem? Well, the problem is that though Israel was faithful enough to enter the promised land, that didn't last long. It was not long before they did not, in fact, choose life and choose to carefully obey the commands the Lord God gave them. In fact, it would seem that they could not choose life. It was not in them to keep all of God's ways. And so we know the rest of the Old Testament story, that they forsook the Lord, that they followed other gods, the book of Judges, Samuel, Kings, eventually exile in Babylon. So what do we do with this then? Perhaps some, some thoughts about Jesus and the wilderness and Israel in the wilderness and at the 40 years, 40 days, maybe some things are starting to come together and that's good. And then we can look at what to do with this. Because I, I suspect we've probably heard a sermon or a Bible study lesson or a Sunday school talk on this passage, either Luke's version, Matthew's version. And probably at some point we've heard some, some, some takeaway points, right? Jesus was tempted in a place of weakness. That's where the devil will come for us. Jesus was tempted in a place of aloneness. But it really matters what we choose, even when we're alone and, and no one else will ever find out. Jesus used scripture to counter the devil's temptation. It's really no, important that we know the scriptures as the word of God. And perhaps in more recent times, there's been a bit of reaction against these sorts of application, maybe based on, well, that's just legalism. That's just, hey, try harder, be better. I don't actually think that any of those points of application are wrong, though. I might even add a few more. God will often allow us to be tempted immediately after some significant moment of progress in our faith. That was the pattern for Jesus. God will allow us often to be tempted severely before bringing us into a place of active and fruitful ministry. That was the pattern for Jesus. Some of the devil's temptations will just be to satisfy our basic cravings and desires. Others will be to pursue good things or even faithful things, but in wrong ways or with wrong motives. Again, that was the pattern of temptation that Jesus faced. The problem, I don't think, is that we draw such lessons at all. They're good lessons. They're true. This is a pattern that we can observe so that God can give us wisdom in, in how to face temptations. I think the problem, though, is if we just leave it there and say, here's some good pointers. We could come up with probably more if we sat down and looked at, at this passage. The problem, if we just leave it there, I think, is pretty simple, actually. The problem is this. What happens if I know all of this? We could come up with another list of good ideas, strategies for resisting temptations. We could add to that. It could be great advice. But what happens when I know that great advice, these great strategies, these principles of how to be more obedient, and I just don't do it? I, I, I know I should resist the temptation, but I just find that I'm too weak. I give in. What then? probably all know what I mean. We've all been there at some point or another. Jesus went out to the desert to do successfully what Israel was unable to do, either in their time out in the desert or subsequent generations in the promised land 
or even the nation as they returned to their land from exile in Babylon. They were never able to resist the temptation to abandon the Lord when things got tough. They were never able to resist the temptation to trust in other things. It seemed that before the exile, the temptation was always trust in other gods. Their ways are easier ways to follow. Whereas after the exile, it seemed to be trust in your own righteousness. Be stricter about how you keep the law. Both of those are equally bad ways of abandoning trust in the Lord. So yes, in this story, we can learn some things about how to recognize temptation, even in some of its more subtle and and twisted forms. And we can learn some important principles to resist it when it does come. But ultimately, I think, what we have in this story is one who obeyed perfectly on our behalf for all of the times that we didn't. What we have here is Jesus who went out into the wilderness alone and faced his own sonship being called into question so that our relationship with our Heavenly Father could be secure. Only Jesus could resist the temptations perfectly and fully. And he did it on our behalf. And so yes, while this passage can teach some strategies and principles for resisting temptation, ultimately what we need to see is that it holds up to us a Savior who resisted it fully in our behalf so that we too could stand firm, and secure as children of God. And it's participating in that reality, in the the security and safety of the relationship with God the Father that Jesus makes possible, right? We get to now participate in that relationship with the Father, through Him, as children of God. It's what we receive in that relationship that ultimately and and finally, in the end, will secure us against temptation. Because it's in that relationship that we are transformed more and more into the image of of Jesus. In just a few moments, we'll be celebrating communion, which in its its fullness is a picture of so many realities of what it means to be a follower of Christ and a child of God. But ultimately, what we celebrate and what we partake in when we come to communion is the recognition that Jesus did on our behalf what we could never do for ourselves. Jesus obeyed fully and completely and totally where we were never able to obey. Right? You probably have heard it said, he lived the life that we should have lived. And Jesus also took our place in his death in our behalf. He died the death that we should have died. And so as we prepare to come before his table, let's do so with that in mind. And with this story of Jesus' obedience in our behalf, firm and fixed in our minds. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you that we serve a Savior who resisted 
every temptation of the devil. Temptations that we know, we know very well, we would have been too weak to resist because we know the many times and occasions in our own lives where we have failed uh, to resist temptations, to avoid things that we knew were wrong or where we were too afraid to do things that we knew to be right. Lord, and as we prepare to come before your table, we do so in recognition that we come not in our own abilities, in our own strength, um, but because our Savior Jesus has taken our place in obedience, in living the life that we should have lived but failed to do, and in his death, in, in, in dying the death that we should have but were spared from. And so as we come, Lord, may we come mindful of that, but also thankful for the way that you have opened up to us in your great mercy and your great love to be called your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.